Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2016 Robert S. Gordon, Jr. Lecture in Epidemiology. My name is David Murray. I'm the NIH Associate Director for Prevention and the Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. I'm pleased to represent Dr. Collins today and introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Collins intended to be here, but was called to a meeting by the Secretary, and I understand he has to go to those when, when she phones. Uh, the Robert S. Gordon Lecture is awarded each year to a scientist who has made major contributions to research or training in the field of epidemiology or the conduct of clinical trials. The Gordon Lecture Award recipient is selected based on the recommendation of the NIH Epidemiology and Clinical Trials Interest Group. This is the 22nd year that the Office of Disease Prevention has sponsored the Gordon Lecture Award. The list of prominent scientists who have previously received this award can be found in our office's website, uh, prevention.nih.gov. The Gordon Lecture Award was established as a tribute to Robert S. Gordon, Jr. for his dedication to the field of epidemiology and clinical trials and for his distinguished service at NIH. Over the course of 30 years, Dr. Gordon served in numerous senior leadership positions, including special assistant to the director and chief advisor for clinical practice and research. He was an early organizer of efforts to address the emerging problem of HIV and AIDS and became a key coordinator of AIDS research on the campus. For the last 10 years, uh, Dr. Gordon made important contributions to policy and management issues regarding epidemiology, clinical trials, and health effects of environmental hazards. Professor Bracken is the Susan Dwight Bliss Professor of Epidemiology, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Reproductive Science and Neurology. He's former head of chronic disease epidemiology and former vice chairman of the Yale School of Public Health. He has studied and taught at Yale for the last 48 years. Professor Bracken has published some 380 articles in the peer-reviewed literature, authored three important books. The second, Effective Care of the Newborn Infant, introduced the concepts of meta-analysis to neonatology in 2006 and was named by the British Medi Medical a journal as one of the most influential books in evidence-based medicine and was instrumental in assisting the foundation of the International Cochrane Collaboration. Professor Bracken is the, uh, was the founding director of the Yale Perinatal Epidemiology Unit and co-director of its successor, the Yale Center for Perinatal, Pediatric, and Environmental Epidemiology. He's taught courses in evidence-based medicine and healthcare, pharmacoepidemiology, perinatal epidemiology, and general epi, at Yale for many years. He's directed numerous epidemiological investigations, almost all of which were funded by NIH. He served on many study sections and committees for us, uh, including the Council of the National Institute of Deafness and Communications Disorders. He chaired the first Congress of Epidemiology in 2001 and the first International Colloquium on Genome-Wide Association Studies in 2006. He consults for many international uh, corporations and agencies, including the World uh, health organization. He has served as the elected president for two major epidemiological associations, both the American College of Epidemiology and the Society for Epidemiologic Research. He is the 2013 recipient of the Lilienfeld Award from the American College of Epidemiology and a 2015 honorary doctorate uh, from the University of Gloucester in the UK for services to medicine. His presentation today is entitled Inefficiency and Waste in Biomedical Research how prevalent is it, what are its causes, how is it prevented. I'm particularly interested in that last aspect. There will be time for questions after his presentation, and I would also in, in, like to invite everyone who's here today to join me at the reception for Professor Bracken at the NIH Library just uh, off to the left uh, after the uh, presentation is over. Now please join me in welcoming the 2016 Robert S. Gordon Lecture Award recipient, Professor Michael Bracken. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Um, uh, looking at the list of previous awardees, I realized that I knew most of them. Uh, I admired all of them. And it's, uh, it's a real privilege to, uh, to join that group. I, I think I knew Dr. Gordon. When I saw his photograph, uh, it sort of rang distant memories. Uh, I wish I'd known him. Uh, it, it turns out that we had a couple of common interests. He, uh, he sang in a choral group, and he enjoyed uh, 
boating, uh, both of which are things I enjoy. So um, it's also nice to be to be uh, linked to, uh, to, to to Dr. Gordon. Let me just show you my disclosure statement. So this was the first paper to directly confront the issue of waste in biomedical research. Uh, Ian Chalmers and Paul Glazier, they're important figures on this, uh, in this topic, and so you'll be hearing more about them. Uh, and they talked about 80, 85% loss uh, in, um, in, in the way we do our medical, medical research. So how do they arrive at 85%? Well, 50% of registered trials are never published in full. 50% of published research has significant flaws, making it unreliable. 50% of published research ignores existing studies, is not based on systematic review, may be redundant, and may be unnecessary. So that sort of gets you down to 12.5%, which they rounded up. And we'll be talking about all of this in more detail. But I want to argue that 85% uh, may in fact be conservative, and I also want to argue that waste is more than just a uh, waste of money, waste of resources. It actually can be harmful to the public's health. And I'll give you, I think, several examples of that. This is the uh, first of five papers which are sort of pivotal for today's talk. Um, I'm going to focus on research design, conduct, and analysis. These were, five were published together in The Lancet in January of 2014. And just to tell you what I am not going to be talking about, uh, I'm not going to be talking about the increased burdens from government regulation on research. I'm not going to be talking about increasingly burdensome IRB regulations that can both delay research startup while the grant money is being spent and they can reduce subject participation and I'm not going to be talking about a misguided focus in academia on, uh, let's call them first reports of, of findings rather than on re reliable replication. These are the authors of the uh, Lancet papers. Uh, Chalmers and Glazier were the sort of conductors of the orchestra here. And uh, I have to say that the opinions of this talk are not necessarily those of the, all of these authors. Some might disagree with them. Uh, I suspect one or two would. So I've got four parts to my talk. Uh, the first is hurricane warning, uh, early warning signs that, that in fact we had a problem. I want to go to that evidence. Uh, maneuvering with difficulty, what other evidence was the uh, Lancet papers based on. Uh, thirdly, we'll be looking at more recent developments uh, and, and actually seeing very little evidence of improvement. And fourthly, some solutions in design, conduct, and analysis. And usually at NIH, there are people with uniforms in the audience who should be very familiar with these signal flags, but I don't see any, any today. So first, um, early warnings that we had a, a problem. This is uh, a paper by John Ioannidis, who is another influential uh, researcher in this area. And he looked at a range of SNPs for various uh, diseases. They were either protective or they were at risk. And on the left-hand side are, are the first studies, and usually based on limited evidence. And then as you track for all of these over time, the larger, perhaps more reliable studies being done, the effect estimates uh, all attenuate towards one. And this is a, a trend that I'm going to, you'll see repeated many times as we, as we go through this. In, in science, uh, well, the winner's curse, of course, is to do with, with uh, an auction. You, if, you, if you win something in an auction, you just bought something that nobody else in the world thinks is that valuable. Um, in science, it, you publish first, but it's likely to be uh, an exaggerated or a wrong result. 
and poorly designed studies have the largest effects. That's a, a, the, one of the common themes. This is looking at a similar thing for randomized trials. Uh, 85,000 forest plots were studied in a text search. Only uh, just under 10% had odds ratios more than five in the first published uh, study. And they were generally found in small trials. And when the effect studies were replicated in 98% in, um, of the large effects actually became smaller in the later trials. So it's a very similar uh, trend in the evidence that we saw from the genetic studies. Uh, something else that was going on in the, in the in early warning was realizing that uh, P less than 0.05 does not mean there's less than a 5% chance of the, that the null is true. And if we think about having a thousand, studying a thousand associations, uh, normally when we do this, we expect 50% of a, the underlying hypothesis, 50% will, will be true, 50% will not. But of course we know that's not right. I mean, most of the things that we study in epidemiology turn out not to be risk factors for the disease that, that we're interested in. So here we're assuming actually only 10% only are likely to be true. We also know in most of our studies that they're underpowered. So here we're assuming there's 50% power rather than the usual uh, 80%. And when you do these calculations, you actually find that the uh, type 2 error rate is um, down here is almost 50%. That's the chance of finding a false result. And if we actually change this and think uh, that actually maybe only one in a hundred of the, of the associations that we study will actually be correct, then the false alarm rate, as it's called, is about 91%. So a very high chance of finding uh, making uh, false decisions about the, uh, the research. And this paper uh, is also a very famous paper, again by Einides, and using a similar sort of calculation, he looked at uh, the predictive value from research, and here's one uh, in uh, adequately powered trials, the predictive value of a trial actually being right, even though it's, it's showing statistical significance, is 85%. And in epidemiology, adequately powered here, 20%. And if, of course, you change your power, that predictive value uh, goes down. Uh, and all of that refers to looking at a single association. And if we look, uh, think about multiple comparisons, and in epidemiology nowadays, it's very easy for a paper to be looking at 50 associations, 100 associations. We see papers that are looking at several hundred associations. And if we start to worry about multiple comparisons, uh, here 40 comparisons, actually your chance of a false positive rate is 90%, um, and so on. So the, um, the risk of being misled in modern epidemiology, modern biomedical research is very high. So that's another background theme. Here's another one, and this is again a, a, a very influential paper. This is looking at uh, comparing uh, protocols from ethics committees, looking at the primary and secondary outcomes, and then comparing them to the published work. And what Chan found was 50% of efficacy outcomes in protocols and 65% of harm outcomes were incompletely reported. Uh, and it was more than that, it was biased. Uh, the statistically significant outcomes being 2.4 times more likely to be reported than non-significant. And for the harm outcomes, 4.7 times. And interestingly, actually, 86% of authors denied the existence of unreported outcomes despite uh, evidence to the, to the contrary. And this is some of the just examples of what he was looking at. A pre-specified primary outcome, event-free survival rate, omitted from the published report. Uh, outcome, overall symptom score changed from a secondary outcome to a primary outcome. And primary outcome, percentage of patients with graft occlusion, 
listed as a new primary outcome and not even mentioned in the protocol. And of course, you can guess why these, these, um, why these changes are being made. And more about that in a minute. As we focused on protocols, uh, it's become clear that they, the protocols themselves are deficient. And in this particular paper, 25% uh, of protocols actually didn't mention the primary outcome. 59% didn't mention allocation concealment. A third didn't mention blinding and so on. So uh, we've made great strides towards protocol registration for trials, but the quality of the protocols is still lacking. And these are protocols from IRBs and science committees. Now I mentioned uh, half research is unpublished. This is some of the evidence. They, it goes across all countries um, and uh, hasn't changed much over, over time. This is another study, uh, and this is looking at countries again, but down here we've got size of trials. Again, uh, less than half are being published. This is looking at class of trial. Uh, so class uh, phase four being published a bit more than phase one or two, but still only about half uh, being published. And uh, this will be academia publishing just over half, industry publishing 40% of their trials. This, this looks at uh, publication over time. And you can see after about five years, then in this analysis, some 60% uh, are being published. And then it just levels off. They, they, they don't get published. So this is trials. Uh, this is registered trials. What would the evidence look like for observational data? Well, we don't really know because we don't register observational studies. But we can be almost certain that it would be worse. This is a, 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 an influential study from Kay Dickerson. This looked at protocols from Hopkins, NIH, uh, and so on. And again, looked at publication and why they were published. And you can see uh, what you would have suspected, I think. It's the significant findings that tend to be published more than the non-significant. Uh, external funding also tends to drive publication. So we've got biased uh, reporting. We've got biased studies. This is why we are worried about, about uh, what is basically publication bias. We'll beat up on nature a little bit here. Uh, it's only fairly recently that we've understood that entire bodies of literature can be biased. It's not just bias in single studies. So negative results often not published, maybe 26 studies performed here. And actually, that's what we're looking at. So um, we, we, we're always looking at limited and restricted bodies of evidence, and what's worse, biased bodies of evidence. So. Um, Another theme that's been going on in the last 25 years is how observational studies and the results from them are being so frequently overturned by trials. So the examples here are from the Women's Initiative trials. Uh, despite many observational studies suggesting benefit from calcium, it wasn't found in the trials. Uh, low risk, uh, a low-fat diet. Uh, no reduction in risk of colorectal cancer, uh, no significant reduction in invasive breast cancer from the trials compared to the observational studies. This is a Cochrane uh, systematic review looking at uh, a typically a 25% reduction in homocysteine. The outcome is cardiovascular disease. And the trials here suggesting no, uh, no effect. But if we look at what the observational studies have found, uh, this is a meta-analysis of them. The typical loss ratio was a reduction of 27% uh, uh, significant. The prospective studies also showing protective effects. And the retrospective studies, and this is typical again, e an even stronger protective effect, highly significant. Uh, but that is contradicted, again, by the trials. So why, you know, why are so many studies here actually wrong? 
And this is perhaps the most famous example of all. We had the nurses' health cohort uh, suggesting uh, re reduction in cardiovascular disease, uh, strong effect, and yet the trial going in the opposite direction. And I know there's been a lot of work trying to suggest that it's different uh, hormones, different age groups, trying to reconcile these. Uh, but I have to tell you, for me, I think the difference is residual confounding in the uh, nurses' study, which, despite the large size of it, it simply could not be adequately uh, controlled. And we have to remember uh, something here, that the large observational studies do not actually um, reduce bias. It, uh, the bias is still there. In fact, it may be amplified in large studies because of the increased power. So, so there, there's lots of issues to do with, with bias, and we'll talk about this again. But the epidemiology community had to deal with this. Uh, it caused a lot of angst in, the, um, in epidemiology departments all across the country. I actually thought Gary Tobbs did us a, a good service in, um, in pointing out some of the problems that we had in conducting epidemiology. And then we also have this, which every epidemiologist is aware of. It's probably part of the slide kit. Uh, today's cough is causing depression in twins. At least it's not in men over 70. So um, another theme, moving on, uh, is, is, is this. This was a paper in the New England Journal, uh, 1992, looking at IV uh, streptokinase for myocardial infarction. And this is a cumulative meta-analysis. So just for those of you who don't know, uh, every time a study gets entered into this, the effect estimate reflects the, the studies that came in before. So that's actually the point estimate there. That's based on two trials. That's the estimate based on three trials. That's, uh, that's the estimate based on four trials, and so on. So this is showing um, many years of, of research looking at this question, and they're all trials. And what you, you, you see is uh, necessary replication in the early, early trials being done, and then at some point, wasteful duplication. Because these trials, and they include some very big ones, ISIS-2 is down here. Um, at this point, you need a, an incredible amount of evidence to switch an estimate from being so protective to, go, to even new, being neutral or going on the other side. So this is um, a technique for looking at the evidence as it is accumulating. And many of these are actually done retrospectively. If they'd been done in a prospective way, which I'll be talking about later on, then you know, maybe some of this would not have been wasted duplication. This is a similar plot for tranexamic acid in, for, uh, used in surgery on the risk of blood transfusion, and again, showing uh, they're all trials showing here. There's a very strong, strong evidence for benefit, and surely these are uh, wasteful duplication. The evidence was in early on this particular uh, question. And this is another famous uh, series of trials looking at antenatal steroids and neonatal death. First trial done by Liggins in New Zealand, 1972, shows a, a significant protective effect and it actually never disappears. It's always the same estimate. All that happens here is the confidence intervals get a little tighter. Uh, so um, wasteful duplication. And of course, wasteful duplication also means patients being submitted to placebos uh, when they could have been on active therapy. Now, to, again, to another theme. Uh, Systematic, re looking at the animal research and uh, the need for systematic reviews. Uh, this analysis uh, found that much research into potential treatments is uh, wasted because the research is poorly conducted. Uh, we'll see that all of the problems that are being discussed in the context of human studies are even greater in the animal research. It's important for, for many reasons. Human studies obviously depend on, at some point on the animal work before you do the first in human work. Um, they're all based on animal studies. And then we've got the issue of animal welfare. Uh, there's never any justification for the use of animals 
in badly designed experiments. And there's never any justification of being humans in badly designed experiments either. So just to remind you of some of the issues in animal experiments, that different species and strains, different metabolic pathways, metabolites are different, um, different models for inducing injury and illness, and that can vary very differently from the human condition, variations in drug dosing schedules and the regimen for drug use, um, variability in animals are selected, is it randomized, Choice of comparison therapies may vary. Uh, loss of follow-up may vary. Small experimental groups with inadequate power. Simplistic analysis doesn't account for confounding. And failure to follow intent to treat principles, one of the cornerstones of human trials, is, is universally ignored in animal research. Um, nuances in lab technique that might influence results. Methods of blinding investigators if that ever happens. Selection of a variety of outcome measures, maybe surrogates or precursors of uncertain relevance to uh, the human condition, and length of follow-up that may not correspond to disease latency. This is an example of TPA and stroke. Uh, everything to the left of the zero is showing a protective effect. Uh, so this is again a cumulative meta-analysis. You can see here uh, again, the early research showing much stronger protective effects than the later work. But uh, here, uh, again, we've got necessary replication and we've got uh, wasteful duplication in the animal work. And in this particular example, um, after about 1,500 animals have been tested, you know, you were down, down here, and yet another 3,700 animals went through testing. So this was a, a, a retrospective cumulative meta-analysis, but if people had actually been tracking this in real time, uh, then surely these, these experiments would not have been done because they were not necessary. Uh, this is just looking at the uh, number of systematic reviews, which I'll be talking about more in a, in a minute. In human studies, it's, uh, 408 per 10,000 publications. In animal studies, 80. So five times more systematic reviews being done in the human work than in the animal, animal work. And I think many of us would argue that this is, even in humans, this is far too small a proportion of systematic reviews being done uh, in relation to all of the, the whole body of, of, of work. So whatever evidence was uh, uh, the, the Lancet paper based on, and I, I will, I, I'm, this is what I'm actually talking about, uh, but this area is low priority questions being addressed, important outcomes not, uh, uh, not being assessed, and patients uh, and, and their clinicians not necessarily being involved in research agendas. Uh, so for example, um, uh, arthritis studies where uh, when they did surveys of patients, they were actually more interested in, in, in questions about fatigue than they were about uh, pain reduction. So that, that's the overall, the overall framework. This is looking at publications and the quality of them, and these are all the percents missing important information, and it's hard to see this, but 49% refers to not mentioning any adverse effects in the abstract, um, 40 to 89 percent inadequate treatment descriptions. I mean, all the things you would be looking for in uh, a publication to explain the methodology, large, large percentages missing when you do this kind, of, uh, this kind of analysis. And redundant epidemiological research. This is looking at the question of, of, of baby's sleeping position to protect against SIDS, front versus non-front and um, looking at, again, a cumulative meta-analysis. And you can see here, again, necessary replication and wasteful duplication. The uh, increased risk from front sleeping position, evident almost from the beginning of this series and clearly evident down, down here. And this particular uh, analysis the author suggested uh, if they'd actually recognized the importance of 
not sleeping, putting babies on their, on their front, then uh, it might have prevented 10,000 infant deaths in the UK and 50,000 in Europe, U USA and Australia. So um, this argues again for uh, what is not just only research waste, but it's also harmful to the public's health. So let me just go back to what an animal systematic review would look like. I've just told you that these are actually quite rare. This happens to be looking at stroke, uh, a stroke drug. And uh, these, these reviewers created a 10-point scale to try and give some quality assessment to the animal experiments. Uh, only one blinded therapy, uh, two blinded assessment. Uh, actually, three of these studies got zero points on this quality scale, and um, the maximum score was seven. And this is a very typical result from going into a body of literature from the animal research and trying to assess the quality uh, of, the, of the studies. And we also see this. Uh, when you rank the quality of the studies, and these remember they're the worst, these are the, this was the best, against the effect sizes, the worst uh, lower quality studies producing the larger effect sizes. And we see that time and time again in doing these kinds of, of analysis. This is looking at uh, trends over time. The, the blue is randomization. And you can see in the, uh, an improvement in the more recent studies after 2006. But still, it's less than a third of these studies are being uh, randomized. Now I want to talk about bias. Um, 235 biases were identified in uh, 70 million PubMed papers. Uh, this is a, quite an active bit of research in its own right. I always thought there were only about 50. But I want to just show you how one bias can actually, in, 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 I'm picking three just as examples, can have a significant effect. So that's recall bias. We're going to look at, look at that. And this is, um, I would say, an infamous meta-analysis of asking the question, uh, if, if a woman has a prior induced abortion, does that increase her risk for breast cancer? This meta-analysis was um, it, it's actually still being used in some state houses to limit reproductive choice. Um, but this is what a Danish study found who didn't, they were all case control studies, who didn't do case, they actually did record linkage. And uh, one and a half million women linked between induced abortion and breast cancer, relative risk of one. So what happened here? Why, do, why, were, uh, why was this inflated risk? Well, you've got to think about how you do these studies. You're asking, women with breast cancer about their previous pregnancy history, and they're likely to tell you everything. And then you're asking often a healthy control group of women about their pregnancy history, and they might not, not tell you all about their previous induced abortions. So, uh, so you get the inflated risk in, um, in, the, in the cases. Uh, some, peop uh, some people did this correctly. Uh, uh, Dr. Brinton from NCI, did a wonderful case, constru case control study, absolutely nailed it there. But look at some of these results. These are wildly uh, high risk estimates, uh, even one protective effect there. So that's how one bias can function and, and influence uh, a body of, of, of literature. Here's uh, interviewer bias. And this is a meta-analysis looking at the question, does residential EMF increased risk for childhood leukemia. We've got the studies here, the high quality studies suggesting uh, no substantial increased risk. The lower quality studies down here suggesting increased risk. And the first study in this whole body of literature was this one, Wertheimer and Leeper. This is a study that closed schools in California. Um, and the interviewer bias comes in because these studies were done looking at wire coding, how, the thickness of electric line, uh, power lines into the house, um, how close to the house were transformers. And these were all estimated by interviewers who in this study knew if the house was a home of a child with leukemia or was a house of a control group. And so 
uh, the, whereas these studies tried to manage that sort of bias, this early study, which had a big effect in, in terms of creating a, public, a major public health scare, uh, didn't manage to, to do that. And the third example I want to use is uh, channeling bias. Channeling is a form of bias by indication, and bias by indication of, uh, in pharmacoepidemiology, of course, is, uh, is the drug that you're worried about causing the outcome that you're interested in, or is it actually the disease that the drug is being used to treat? So this is looking at the question of uh, congenital cardiac defects after the use of specific antidepressants. Uh, Hybrex, who uh, had a big uh, Medicaid of almost a million women database, actually tried to look at the eff effect of potential for, for confounding um, from the underlying depression and from associated factors associated with being depressed. Uh, these are some of those factors, and these are the, uh, the three SSRIs that were studied. So higher rates of smoking, about two and a half times, uh, two and a half times the rate of being diabetic and about two and a half times the rate of um, using other suspected teratogens. So that's the confounding. And what, this is the unadjusted analysis and we, we see increased risks here and this is typical of a whole series of studies that were done that were not able to control for indication by bias. Uh, but in this analysis, they, they first of all did a, an analysis in the depressed women group, and you can see those estimates have moved towards unity. And then they also controlled for uh, 200, actually, in a propensity score, potential confounders. And you can see they, they've even moved closer to, to unity. That's, that's where they started out. So um, uh, another example where... If you, unless you're very careful, you can be misled, um, le misled by the, uh, the observational studies. So what about recent, um, r recent changes? So this is a paper that came out in Science at the end of last year, looking at psychological sciences, and they uh, tried to replicate studies. This is the, uh, that line there would be the replication. 83% showed stronger effects in the original study, uh, and the effect size in the replicate was half that in the original studies. So another example of the things that we've been, we've been talking about here, and here, here were actually replicates that went in the opposite direction. Um, the, of course, in the original, almost all were meeting the 0.05 level. In the replicate, only 36% did, and this is interesting. Interesting, you know, we expect when we do replications, 95% of the effect estimate will be within the confidence intervals of the, uh, uh, of the original study. Here it was only 41%. So it's actually not just a, uh, a simple failure to replicate, it's actually gross uh, um, uh, failure to, to, to replicate. As you might expect, this has been uh, challenged by some of the, uh, by, by people in psychology that's a number they came up, and it's being pushed back again uh, by the original authors. 83% of rep replications had smaller effect size. It's kind of close to that 85% we talked about right at the beginning. Um, in the animal world, uh, it continues to be poorly designed. Uh, this, was, this cover that they did of our, of our paper was quite interesting. You see down here all the rats, uh, and here we are. And it's a long distance from there to there, isn't it? And that's obviously uh, part of the problem. But um, it's one of the problems why it's so hard to predict to, to humans from rodent uh, models. What's wrong? Well, there aren't enough systematic reviews of animal studies. I've shown you that. Many studies are poorly designed and performed. I've shown you that. But not adequately reported. And. Um, I think this is a state of play that we observed in human studies about 40 years ago, um, and it, it's, just, it's going to take time to, uh, to catch up. This is a, looking at uh, uh, trials in, um, in, in uh, 1,286 trials in uh, 205 Cochrane reviews, trying to using the Cochrane risk of bias tool uh, only 16% were, 
met low risk of bias, 41% unclear, high risk 43. So 16% you could clearly say were low risk. Uh, and these are, these are the sources of bias. Um, this is actually sequence generation, allocation, concealment, randomization, um, blinding of participants, that's what we call performance bias, 58% there at high risk. And these are uh, blinding of the outcome assessment and uh, incomplete outcome data or attrition bias. So high, still high rates of bias. Uh, what these authors did was then try and look for how they might adjust these studies to uh, reduce the risk of bias and found that actually with almost very little cost, very little effort, you could reduce some of these uh, biases by, by 50%. So it's not an issue of cost, and it's not an issue of, do, of, of sort of ease of doing it. It's actually an issue of knowing that it should be done. And this is from uh, Ben Goldacre's website in the UK. He's considered continued to look at uh, what the protocol says in trials, what the outcomes say. He looked at 67 trials, nine reported perfectly compared to the protocol, 300 outcomes not reported. 357 new outcomes silently added. So still continuing problems here. He actually went on and sent letters to the 58 journals pointing out the fact that these publications were uh, differed from their protocols and um, only seven have been published so far. And a meta-analysis again looking at the median uh, discrepancy between protocol and outcome reporting 31% of trials had a discrepancy. I guarantee you in observational epidemiology, that would be much higher. So some solutions uh, for um, trying to improve a situation. I want to talk, the first is to reduce the play of chance. Uh, I think the play of chance can pr produce erroneous results. Uh, we of course always worry about it, but I think that we've, we've greatly underestimated uh, how this can work. Uh, this is the most famous, the most cited after dinner speech in science history, Bradford Hill. Uh, he asked for perfectly clear cut and beyond what we would care to attribute to the play of chance before actually moving on and doing his causality analysis. And clearly, um, we're not doing this. Recall how liberal a p-value 0.05 is. So in, um, in, in my recent book, I've actually suggested that uh, sigma two, which is our usual alpha, should be changed. We should be actually looking at 0 0.01 or even 0 0.05 because we are spending so much time and resource following false leads. And uh, a beta, I think, should always be 0 0.1. 0 0.2 is too liberal. And this contradicts, of course, popular epidemiology teaching which tends to go in the other direction of let's sort of uh, not worry about the p-value. Uh, but I think that has led us to some really uh, harmful findings as I've discussed earlier. And I can't think of a single important risk factor that would have been missed by using more stringent p-values, but there are a great many false positive findings that we could have done without. So get rid of that. Um, the American Statistical Association just last, uh, j just last month almost, talked about the uh, use of this 05 level leading to distortion of the scientific process. Uh, and I, I think the discussion should be made about the 01 level, not the 05. And this is from, uh, again, last uh, JAMA last uh, month. Um, they looked at uh, 4.6 million p-values in 1.6 million Medline abstracts. Again, one of these text mining exercises but concluded more stringent p-value thresholds are probably warranted across scientific fields. The 05 in almost all abstracts suggests that this threshold has lost its discriminating ability for separating false from true hypotheses. And just to go back to Bradford Hill, you should remember when Bradford Hill was actually writing and doing his work, people in one paper usually studied one hypothesis. Does smoking increase risk for lung cancer? They didn't have, they didn't have the computing capacity to, to study 200 uh, associations in one paper like, like we do. So, um, no, it's a, it's, it's a different world. And again, from the American Statistical Association, um, 
it's important to know how many and which analyses were conducted and uh, how, how they were selected for reporting. So again, now paying more attention to multiple comparisons, which epidemiologists always comment on in their discussion sections, but rarely correct for. So that, uh, of course, we often use Bonferroni in genetics. Um, Bonferroni is still frequently used. I know there's false discovery rates and uh, different methods. Bonferroni is quite simply that. Um, and if Bonferroni, if people knew the citation to Bonferroni, it would probably be the most cited paper in the biomedical literature. Actually, that's the reference to Bonferroni, and it is very obscure. Um, so that's probably why it's not actually cited. But, but Bonferroni is, is quoted a lot. Uh, the issue of larger, better powered trials is not new. It's proposed by Richard Pito. He was a 2002 Gordon Awardee, by the way. Uh, that's him on the left. It's Richard Dull down, sitting down there. And uh, Pito was suggesting if one's trying to decide how, how billions of future pac patients should be treated, it may be appropriate to randomize at least many thousands or, or even tens of thousands. And just to remind you, this is what simple large trials are all about. Avoid random error with large numbers detect small or moderate but important effects, uh, use more important clinical outcomes, randomize in an easy way using the uncertainty principle, simplify data collection, analyze intent to treat. Bias, how do we reduce bias? Well, the um, protocol registration has gained absolutely no traction in epidemiology, widely used in trials, actually required now in trials by journals, by the institute, it's been vehemently opposed uh, in epidemiology that protocol registration should occur. Uh, we've argued that if PhD students have to record a protocol, why not the rest of us? And of course, the same imperatives for reg registering trial protocols apply to observational epidemiology. So this is still a work in, uh, a work in progress. There are numerous guidelines um, being produced. Um, PRISMA for meta-analysis -an guidelines, Spirit for protocols, strobe for observational studies, uh, consort for trials, and uh, this is all very helpful. We even have now uh, animal guideline trials, uh, and these are all actually for reporting guidelines, but of course if you know how you're expected to report studies, then that should improve study design and conduct. Um, and the NIH has jumped in, and they've, they've got uh, plans to enhance reproducibility. And the bits I picked out from that, this paper, uh, improve training and experimental design, all meant to that. Uh, improve data transparency, that of course is to do with uh, making data sets available for wide use. And systematic eva evaluation and grant application to look at the scientific premise. And I just want to expand on that a little bit, the scientific premise. So this has got to do with uh, using systematic reviews of extant evidence in the protocol. And this is actually looking at uh, a citation analysis on uh, grant applications. These are the studies that do not support the uh, hypothesis for the grant application. It managed to get one, re one site. These are the studies that do support the application, and of course they got heavily cited. Um, so this is using a non-systematic method of looking at evidence in a protocol. And this occurs even when uh, research from the same laboratory is being cited. They somehow don't mention their studies that were not successful. This is a, 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 came from a protocol for uh, the CRASH trial. The CRASH trial was looking at use of steroids for head injury. Um, and these are the trials that w had been done up until that point. That's the risk estimate. But if you look at the numbers in these trials, the denominators, you know, 5, 12, uh, 50, 80, 81. I mean, th this is a, a body of evidence that is not going to give you the answer you want. So this is actually uh, many years, 23 years of wasted wasted research. Uh, the crash, I'll, and I'll come back to the crash trial in a second, but this is how you would like to see 
uh, evidence presented in a protocol, but it's the extant evidence that you're now going to go and test further. So systematically then updating all of the evidence after study completion, uh, uh, Chalmers again and uh, Michael Clark discuss this as islands in search of continents. This is your, putting your finding from your research back into the body of evidence, uh, misquoting John Don here, that's okay, islands in search of continents. Uh, they looked at 26 trials. One was the first trial on the question, so there's obviously nothing to integrate, but t only two of the 25 trials actually put their results back into an updated systematic review. And they updated this finding more recently. Uh, 106 trials looked at, 12 were first trials. But again, only three of the uh, 94 that are left integrated their results into a systematic review. The crash trial, uh, when it finished, was a, a large simple trial. It actually meant to randomize 20,000. It stopped after 10,000 because of the result. This is the crash trial here. So that's what we just looked at. And when you actually do, redo the meta-analysis with um, their result, then you get a clear uh, evidence, 80% increased risk of mortality in patients treated with the steroids. And then the overall review now taking all the evidence into account, 12% increased, increased risk. So that's an island finding its uh, continent. And I want to just finish with this. This is actually the first sentence in the first paper, in the first issue of the New England Journal in, nine, in 1812. And uh, that's what it says, it's easy to read. In our inquiries into any particular subject of medicine, our labors will generally be shortened and directed to their proper objectives by a knowledge of preceding discoveries. So they're not asking about systematic reviews, they didn't know about that, but they are, even back then, asking for uh, a proper reintegration of your research findings into the entire body of, of knowledge. So just to summarize, uh, to reduce the play of chance by designing studies with more stringent alpha and beta values, using much larger studies, pay more attention to threats from multiple comparisons, strive harder to reduce bias, it subverts all our research, and try and comply with these standards and guidelines. Journals need to do this. We have evidence that journals who are supposed to be asking authors to comply with the consort uh, trial guidelines are not doing so. Systematically review the extant evidence in a published protocol before starting new research. This is something NIH could actually insist on. MRC has already. Uh, follow the protocol outcomes when reporting findings or declare in the paper the differences, why you've gone to a different outcome, and systematically update new findings in the context of all available uh, research. So uh, here's, here's Robert Gordon. Um, and I, uh, he, I know he had, had many epidemiological interests, he, uh, an administrative post at NIH, and I am confident he would have supported the need to stop in waste. Thank you. Yes, please. Just two comments. With respect to animal models becoming useless, now there are several companies now printing uh, 3D versions of human cells. It could be used at least in terms of acute uh, drug reactions and things. It might eliminate the use of, of animals. And um, I, I guess that's, uh, and in terms of, of your comments before, you were referring to the multiple comparison problem which is prevalent in a lot of, of studies. And you, it's, I think it's kind of unavoidable because when people st first start doing something, there's no doubt they're going to make a modification. And when they make a modification, in fact, what they're really doing is just designing a new study. But most people don't have the realization that things have to be as to the original protocol. But I, it, it doesn't sound possible in, in some of these more complicated studies to actually go through without making some changes as to primary or secondary endpoints or modifications. So I think by definition, you're never really gonna reach perfection, no? 
Right, so um, the point about your second point is, is to be transparent. I mean, as a reader of, of, of a research paper, I think you'd like to know about those modifications. And, um, and unfortunately, that is often not what, um, what happens. What was the first point? And the, the other thing is, in terms of p-values, there are some journals not at the level of nature or science that have abolished psychological journals, and I forgot which one it is, but it's abolished the use of p-values in smaller studies and saying that the only, they will only now accept descriptive studies because they found that the p-values were misleading. In smaller studies, it's a less significant journal of psychology or psychiatry or something. I, I, I know that they made a comment on it in nature. Right, so, um, you know, there are, I don't know, what, 3,000 journals, 4,000 journals, it seems to be more and more every, every week. But um, there are a handful, not many, that, that have suggested uh, you shouldn't use p-values, you should use just the confidence interval, and of course people then use the confidence interval and, uh, and interpret it as if it was a p-value. But um, there is um, still... Broad, broad use of p-values uh, by the FDA, by leading journals. And I think the, uh, the issue I'm making is I think the p-values are actually too liberal in the way we do our research nowadays. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they, they get translated as being... Uh, they, they're given more importance than they, than they really deserve just because they meet the O5 threshold. And certain specialties, such as pathology or forensic pathology, by their very, very nature, are not going to be able to provide the, the type of, of quality in terms of studies because they don't have a clinical element. So I guess not many of them are going to go to nature or science, but I'm just making the point that not every specialty is going to ha be equipped to conform to these types of standards. Yeah. Okay. There's another person who has a question. I better let him. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, Mike Lauer from the Office of Extramural Research. That was a, a fantastic talk, and I want to thank you for and congratulate you for getting this uh, award and for coming to talk with us today. So, um, uh, we're, as you mentioned, NIH is now trying to uh, address this head on, and uh, we have changed some of the requirements for our applications, um, and uh, we are also changing our review criteria. And one of the things that we are seeing is that. Um, the, the response of the community is decidedly mixed. Um, some people think that this is wonderful, we're moving in the right direction, and other folks are getting very defensive and are saying, why is our area of science, and you can just name the area of science, why is our area of science uh, under attack? And this is yet again another example of the government um, piling more and more regulations upon us and trying to micromanage us and trying to tell us how to do our research, and we investigators know how to do best, and why don't you just leave us alone and let us be creative? So help us. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't have to be government regulation. In, in, in fact, in, in, uh, in Europe now, there's a lot of emphasis in trying to uh, train people, uh, people doing animal work uh, in, in good methodology. Um, you know, the Medical Research Council has shown great interest in this. It's, it, it, but it's, there's a strong push from academia uh, and people who actually work in these areas to, um, to up, the, you know, up, up the quality of, of the studies. So I don't, I, I don't, I'm not personally in favor of government regulation either. But I think it should, it should be self-evident to people in academia that they need to clean up their act. And it's not to say, and I hope I've not left the impression that everything in human research is, is, is all fine, because it's not. I mean, we certainly have our problems, and I, and I think I've given you some examples. But um, I think the low-hanging fruit here uh, in, in, in the biomedical world is to try and tackle the folks doing the animal, animal work and at least up, you know, bring them more up to speed in what you expect in doing these, these studies. Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, um, Mike just referred to changes in the rules, uh, asking people to pay more attention to methods, for example, to paying more attention to uh, reviewing what had been done previously. Um, my concern is that if there aren't changes to the way that the applications are reviewed, in terms of what the reviewers do, uh, there's no enforcement uh, of those uh, new requirements. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, um, study sections are perhaps the most powerful 
group, if you think of the whole process of, of, of how we apply for money and get it and do the research, I mean, they're, they're really the gatekeepers for um, changing, changing behavior. And if, if study sections start to impose um, tougher methodological criteria on the research that they're reviewing, the word will get back very quickly to um, investigators in academia that they need to pay more attention to this. And um, you know, I think the society, that perhaps the societies would, would help with this, and, and even uh, within, within the university, uh, you might find uh, epidemiologists are actually happy to go and talk to the, um, uh, the people doing the animal work. And that happens in my place, it happens in, in, in some other places. Uh, but I think the, study, the way study sections function could have a, a, a large effect in, in improving things.